I'm really excited today to have Jerry Noyce, who is the president of the HERO organization. Um, Jerry became president and CEO of HERO in April 2010 after a national search for a successor to the um, retiring, or, yeah, to the retiring Bill Whitmer. Uh, prior to joining HERO, Jerry was, Jerry was with uh, Health Fitness Corporation, or he led Health Fitness Corporation uh, to becoming a premier provider of health and fitness services uh, in, the health, in the healthcare industry. Um, they, let's see, and under his guidance, they, I believe you acquired health fitness, health and fitness division of Johnson and Johnson and also health calc. Jerry's uh, had a lot of uh, great experience and today he's going to talk about um, a project uh, that they've recently completed and the topic of today's webinar is building consensus on the appropriate use of health outcomes based incentives in a wellness program. So Jerry, are you ready to start talking? I am, Michael. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to, to meet with the folks today, and thanks everyone for uh, attending this uh, webinar. This is actually the first webinar that we're doing on this topic. Uh, as some of you may know, we released this guidance document a couple weeks ago, or the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine actually released it, but it's been a work in progress since uh, February of uh, 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 this year, and uh, we're really excited about the fact that uh, it's finally come to fruition and pleased that we have an opportunity to share it with uh, a broad range of employers and, and providers of services. And so, uh, again, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, Michael I mentioned we'll have questions at the end. Um, because it's my first spin through this, you know, I really appreciate any feedback you can give me about the presentation, which will help us as uh, we continue to meet with different groups and share uh, the guidance that we've created. First of all, a little bit about HERO for those of you that might not know uh, uh, who HERO is, the Health Enhancement Research Organization. We're a nonprofit 501c3, so we're not a lobbying organization. Um, and we were founded in 1996 actually to do research, and I know many of you are familiar with the original HERO research studies that, uh, that were foundational in terms of linking uh, changes in health risks, modifiable health risks to financial impact in terms of health care costs for employers. So that was uh, what start, how the organization started. Um, our vision um, has changed through the years, and this is our vision as created by our board of directors just a month or so ago. And our vision today is to promote a culture of health. So we'll talk a little about a culture of health in this uh, presentation today. And performance and uh, through, the employer, through employer leadership. And we think that this is kind of an, an important statement because we talk about the importance of creating a culture of health. And I think all of us would agree that that's a very critical component to improving health of the employee population or of any population that we might be working with. And performance now enters into our discussion because we're seeing so many more organizations, employer organizations, connecting with this concept of improving productivity through in, in, uh, optimizing performance of the workforce. And there's a lot of uh, good research that's going on in this field. We actually at HERO have a research study that will be coming out later, uh, excuse me, uh, begin, beginning of uh, August that um, talks about the connectivity between presenteeism in, work, in a workforce uh, population of about 20,000 workers and um, uh, their health status and their health behaviors. And so that will be an interesting piece to add to the literature that, and research that's going on in this area. And then we strongly believe that employers across America are really helping to drive this uh, whole discussion around improving health. And uh, it's not only today about um, trying to have a wellness program in your um, organization to affect health care costs, to try to control health care costs, but it's also important uh, uh, for you to have that for the uh, purpose of improving organizational performance. And I think that's a much broader uh, view of the world, and we believe that employers are really uh, at the forefront of leading this charge. 
Bureau's got uh, four, uh, four major areas that we work in. Uh, first of all, I'll start at the bottom, research, which I mentioned to you, and we are continue to be active there. We have a HERO a Forum, which is our conference every year, um, and that uh, this year will be October 2nd to 4th in Minneapolis, and we hope some of you will attend. We, uh, we'd love to have you there. One of the special features of that event is going to be the Cooper Union Dinner, which all in attendees will be invited to attend on the evening of October 2nd, which will be part of your registration. We've invited all past Coop Award winners dating all the way back to 1991 when Hillary Clinton uh, presented the first uh, group of awards. And we've got many of the uh, organizations that have won Coop Awards in the past uh, that will be uh, attending. And we really want to make it a celebration of worksite wellness programs over the last 30 years. So hope you'll attend that. Um, we um, have developed, uh, as many of you know, of the, uh, the HERO Employee Health Management Best Practice Scorecard in collaboration with Mercer. That's an online tool. Um, just yesterday, we had a conference and our latest count numbers of organizations that have submitted their information um, is over 750 now. So this database of best, practice, best practices continues to grow and we'll continue to be able to look to the data to be able, even though it's on a self-reported basis, but we can look to the data and the experience of these organizations that report to help identify linkages between practice and outcomes. And uh, frankly, uh, I think Michael and I, when we first talked about uh, our doing this webinar, had thought that it might be around the scorecard. Hope to do that in a future uh, webinar with you. But uh, because of the relevance of the uh, guidance document that was released and the, the, the recent uh, recentness of that uh, release, we thought this would be an appropriate topic for today. And finally, our think tank is our driving force of HERO. That's an 80-plus member uh, company organization, represents employers, represents uh, universities who uh, are interested in their own programs and also in research that we do, represents consultants in the field of benefits consulting, and, can, and represents uh, providers of services. Um, and health plans and health systems. And that, are, that group of think tank members are the ones who are responsible for the scorecard, for the forum, and help us with our research. So that's enough about us. Excuse me, I just jumped one. Let's just start to talk about what we know today um, and give a little background as we get into talking about the guidance. Uh, first of all, um, as we know, as we all know, that uh, properly designed wellness programs really can have an impact. And that's through a lot of research that's been done over the years. We know it improves employee health. We know that there's a financial return somewhere between 2 and 3 and $4 for every dollar invested. We understand uh, through experience of employers um, and through research that uh, we can lower health care costs and other costs associated with chronic distance disease and disability by reducing health risks. And um, we also realize, as we talked about, that we can have an impact on absenteeism and presenteeism and improve uh, productivity. What else do we know? Well, we know that uh, health care costs are escalating and that they're at an unsustainable rate. And that's not new news to any of us. And we know that in rising health insurance premiums are forcing employers and especially small businesses to drop health insurance coverage for their employees or uh, the other part of that would be to increase the out-of-pocket costs for the employees. And since 94, as it mentions, average uh, costs paid by the employees have really risen. And uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but nearly eight times faster than the average U.S. household income. Um, and now 36% of Americans are now forced to limit the amount of money they put toward retirement because of rising health care costs. So that's a view of the landscape. Also, um, health care spending has risen um, significantly between 2009 and 2010, our most recent numbers. And that uh, total health care expenditures, as you know, is over $2 trillion, which is about $8,500. Uh, per person, and it's about almost 18% of the nation's gross domestic product. So this is completely unsustainable. What do we know about prevention? Well, we know that there are four 
uh, modifiable health risk factors that are responsible for most of the chronic disease in the U.S. And as those are listed, it's tobacco use, nutrition, lack of act physical activity, and excessive alcohol consumption. And that cardiovascular disease uh, can start early in can uh, start early in life and is affected by these risk factors. So people that reach middle age uh, with fewer risk factors have a lower lifetime risk for uh, cardiovascular disease mortality um, and have an increased survival and improved quality of life. And Dr. Fries at Stanford and others have done a lot of work in that area to talk about the uh, compaction of morbidity. What about health care reform? Well, the Affordable Care Act, really um, what it did at its basis in, as it related to um, employer wellness programs is really codified the existing statute that existed in HIPAA that allows employers to, uh, you know, that in, for them to uh, be able to charge their employees a differential in premium based on meeting certain health status factors. And this is uh, important. That is for wellness programs that are tied to the employer-sponsored um, health uh, offered health uh, insurance program. And these factors could include things like body mass index, tobacco cessation, cholesterol, and blood pressure. Those are the four most common pieces. Um, and um, the, uh, in fact, what we found out is that um, uh, most of the companies that have gone to really doing this, those are the four most important measures that they've used. Um, the other thing that uh, the original uh, statute allowed for, and that is in this, uh, that's addressed in the Affordable Care Act, the statute allowed for a differential increase between of up to 20 percent of the uh, combined premium for uh, both the employer and the employee coverage. So it is the total cost of, or the total premium cost, not just the employee portion or just the uh, employer portion, but it's the combined portion, and that if the program, if, if it includes family members, that it's, it could be 20% of the family cost. Well, as you know, the Affordable Care Act said that starting in 2014, this, in, this uh, limit can be raised to 30%, or will be, and that it allows HHS uh, the opportunity to increase the limit to 50% over time if they deem this is appropriate. Now, it's interesting. I uh, uh, hosted a panel discussion uh, about a couple months ago at the American General Health Promotion Conference on this area of discussing financial incentives. And Dr. Kevin Volk from the University of Pennsylvania, who's done a lot of research in the area of the, in, of the impact of incentives on uh, improving health, mentioned something that I thought was very interesting. And he says, you know, we as researchers, uh, for many years have done great research and found that uh, through our research effectiveness of different things and then have, uh, once we have found uh, these improvements, have then gone to Congress and tried to uh, uh, have legislation passed that would address these uh, improvements that we've been able to research. Here's an example of a situation where there is not a lot of research that frankly has been done in this area at all. There's a lot of research that needs to be done yet, but yet the um, uh, legislation is in place. Well, if you take a look at um, what this means in terms of dollars, here's a slide that shows you what the impact would be on an individual and a family plan based on 20% uh, premium up to, or incentive up to almost $1,100 for an individual per year and over $3,100 for a family. And what it would look like, again, starting in 2014, that goes up to $1,600 or $4,600 and could rise above that. And one of the questions, obviously, is out there is uh, what is the appropriate amount that really should be if, if an organization gets involved in this kind of an approach and in incentives, what is the appropriate amount that really should be offered? And uh, this gives you a wide range of uh, possibilities. Well, one thing we also know is that employers are moving in this direction because uh, we understand uh, that about 
um, according to a recent survey, about 35% of the companies uh, have reported using rewards or penalties based on smoking or tobacco use in 2012. Another 17% plan to add these incentives in 2013. And um, uh, so we see that, according to Tower Watson, that 62% of these employers plan on switching from incentive, their incentive program from participation to incentives for improvement in health metrics. So this is definitely a trend that is happening. Employers are taking advantage of this opportunity through legislation to more directly tie their incentives to achieving health outcomes versus participation. And employers are innovating in this way to, uh, based on being able to make an impact on their health care costs, as we know. But there's a number of concerns that have been voiced. Um, and these concerns were voiced very strongly by uh, some of the groups who have worked together uh, in this collaboration, specifically American Cancer and American Cancer Network, uh, American Diabetes, and American Heart Association. That um, there are some concerns about there was no clear definition in the legislation around what is a health status factor. A health status factor. Um, the regulations do not really. The regulations describe that a program that would be allowed would be um, allowed to be able to offer this differential should be should include a reasonably designed wellness program or offer alternative standards for those who cannot meet the, the program metrics uh, because of health-related conditions, but does not describe what a reasonably designed wellness program is. And um, as we've said, uh, there's limited evidence that, that uh, financial in, these in financial incentives really will uh, increase, uh, uh, in terms of, will have an Im impact on increasing one's long-term health. Another concern that has been voiced is that these premium variations, whether they be offered as an incentive, a reduction in premium cost to the employee, or as a penalty, an increase in premium cost to the employee, um, they may penalize people with pre-existing conditions and those that have a genetic predisposition towards, uh, towards disease. What we do know is um, that evidence does show that individuals uh, will delay needed health care because of the cost for them to be able to go in and have uh, checkups and normal checkups and, and see the doctors. So we know that, that's, that that is true. We've seen that in research. And we know that high deductible benefit designs requiring significant cost sharing could create uh, barriers to preventive care and disease management. So these were some of the concerns coming in as the legislation was initially announced and uh, voiced by um, the consumer advocacy groups. On the other hand, um, uh, there were, other, there were other points as well, and one of the points, obviously, is that we know that today that businesses um, are spending about or are covering about 76% of the cost of the total health care cost for the employees. And when you figure that um, there's about 150 million people that are being covered by health care today, and, um, the cost of about $8,500 per employee, that that's a significant investment in health that employers are making. And there's also concern that employers need to have the ability to do some innovation as they try to control medical costs and improve the, the health of their employees, which is their primary concern, improving the health of their employee population. So what happened, um, and it was a very interesting um, process, is that once the Affordable Care Act was released and people had a chance to digest the information, um, some of the uh, organizations that were concerned from the consumer or the employee advocacy perspective um, had voiced their concerns uh, to the government. And then others that were interested in uh, this, not only from the employee perspective, but from the employer perspective, had also voiced their concerns, and I think you're, you may be familiar with some of those um, public documents that uh, came out over a year ago. Well, 
Um, I was actually in um, Senator Harkin's office a year ago uh, this month and was talking with his health care staff and they uh, mentioned to me that uh, this had become one of the one of the largest discussion points and one that was so controversial was the appropriate use of outcomes based incentive approach in a wellness program and um, asked us hero what our position might be on this and so we formed a group of uh, our members of our think tank to really study the whole issue of incentives and specifically outcomes based incentives and then in February, as I mentioned, um, we got together uh, with American Heart, Cancer, Diabetes, and the American College of Occupational Environmental Medicine, ACOM. So that group met in Atlanta on February 1st. There were about 35 of us either on the phone or in the room, and it represented all those different groups. It represented employers who actually have these programs in place or are thinking of going in that direction. It represented con uh, benefits consultants who are working with clients who have those programs or are go thinking of going in that direction. It represented providers in the, s in the same fashion. It represented the um, corporate medical directors through ACOM's voice. And then it represented the employees and the uh, consumer advocacy group through the other groups. So it was a broad uh, based uh, discussion and about 35 people and we spent a full day just talking about what our concerns were, what our approaches were, and was there an opportunity for us to find common ground in this discussion. And if we did, what would that look like? And we came away from that meeting believing that we absolutely could find common ground. And I think the employers that uh, participated in that discussion really helped um, some of the groups who were concerned about the employer's uh, approach to this whole area of outcomes-based incentives. What their, what their um, intent was, it, it came across loud and clear from the employers that it was really about improving the health and trying to improve the health of their employees and that they were not at all trying to discriminate between uh, different groups of employees. And so I think as we started to get through that discussion and started to talk with what our concerns were and how, um, what kind of evidence is out there based on uh, just experience that some of the providers, uh, clients had had implementing these programs, we were beginning to form a, a collective opinion. And what we came away with was we agreed that we um, did not necessarily, we don't have enough information to be able to say whether we would recommend or not recommend this approach. That wasn't really our position. But what we really felt was necessary was to be able to give some guidance to the employers, first of all, who are either thinking of or have moved in this direction around some of the elements that they should consider in terms of including outcomes-based outcomes incentives in their program. And then secondarily, we thought that one of the um, uh, uh, results of this guidance could be to help guide the, let the regulations that are being um, created by Department of Labor around this, this uh, legislation, which are still forthcoming. So we, as we talked about it, we said that there's really uh, two key elements in the legislation that needed to be addressed because they were not well defined. The first is what constitutes a reasonably designed program and then what's a reasonable alternative standard for those that for because of medical conditions uh, cannot uh, achieve uh, the, the uh, health standard that is being requested. And then the third piece that we said um, we should uh, identify was what are some of the, the future research questions that need to be answered so we can improve our understanding of the use of these types of incentives and really of all incentives? So, as you know, we created this joint consensus statement. Um, and this is, uh, it was published online and has uh, also been published in print version by the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine. You're welcome uh, to download it uh, by either going to the Journal of Occupational Environmental Medicine's uh, site or you can go to HERO's website, www.
www.hero.org. And um, the uh, paper is posted on our website along with some uh, associated materials. And you're welcome to, uh, to take a look at that. And if you think, as you review this material, um, we're, all of our groups are, are asking that as you review this material, if you either individually or your organization that you represent feel that this guidance is appropriate, we encourage you to endorse the guidance, as you'll see some organizations have done and who are listed already as we start this process, because we think this is really important to be able to speak with a, with a, with a voice on this important topic. So what's the guidance? Well, the, first of all, we believe that the fundamental goal of any wellness program should be providing opportunities for individuals to improve their health and wellness, and that the program really shouldn't th threaten an employee's ability to maintain their health insurance. So we agreed upon that, and this would uh, conflict with improving the whole goal of improving their health. So we agreed that the goal would not be to uh, deny insurance coverage to anybody or make it so expensive that they would not be able to afford it. Also, um, we suggested, you know, the evidence suggests that long-term lifestyle modification or risk factor management requires more than financial motivation. And, of course, you know, we're still early in all of that, but there's going to be a lot of research that needs to be done yet. We know that a certain amount of financial incentives do, in, in fact, increase participation in programs, but yet to, yet to be determined whether they really have an impact in terms of person really modifying their health behavior. And we know that success in modifying these health behaviors is based on both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, obviously, with the financial incentives being the extrinsic and extrinsic motivator. And third, we know that one of the keys to these uh, to a, a successful worksite wellness program is being able to, uh, to, to maintain this or sustaining this change in a worksite culture, that, uh, environment that supports health and wellness. And this gets back to our vision of creating a culture of health throughout the United States and some of the work that we've done in, at HERO with our HERO scorecard, which really asks questions around strategy and leadership development and, um, and really gets at the question of, is your organization, if you have a program, is your leadership committed to creating this culture of health or including health, integrating health into the culture of the organization so that the employees truly have a feeling that this is an important part of uh, what the organization stands for. Then we wanted to look at uh, what a reasonably designed program might look at. And so um, we used the, the HERO scorecard as, in its six domains uh, of questions that we ask as our model because we felt that through the development of the scorecard by many of the top researchers in the field who went through an extensive literature review um, and uh, it came up with the questions and as well as the scoring system and that we've had the program out there for a period of time and it's shown to be quite valid in terms of relating outcomes to process um, in uh, these programs, that this was a good construct for us to promote a reasonably designed program. And the program elements uh, that are incorporated in the scorecard and that we believe are reasonable for a program include a, a long-term strategic plan, a multi-year strategic plan, if you would, cultural support, as we mentioned, from the leadership, both through their, their, uh, uh, their support of the program and their active support by being engaged themselves, hopefully and that programs for assessment and screening are an important part of this, that um, a program is just not, our concern was a program uh, in some employer situations would not just be this outcome-based incentive, but that it would have behavior change interventions, programs and activities and information that's available uh, to the employees to make sure that it helps support them as they work along this road of improving their personal health. Um, engagement is an important part of that with communications uh, strategies. It's important that communications be part of it and that incentives, if they be used, uh, that they be appropriate and in a value 
that uh, reflects what's trying to be accomplished by the organization. And that finally, that some form of measurement and evaluation be included in this program. So these are the basic elements. And in our paper, if you go to, go to it, you'll be able to see where we describe those in more detail. Then we looked at uh, specifically at incentives, of course, and said, uh, what do we think about in terms of uh, giving guidance around incentive design? And we really felt that, first of all, and this is um, a part of the legislation, says that it has to be related to in, uh, health promotion and disease uh, prevention. So the goal of the incentive has to be to promote health promotion and de disease prevention programs that will have a positive impact in reducing uh, the degree of chronic disease. Um, the legislation also talks about the, them not being over, overly burdensome and, and so hard to achieve that um, uh, it would either from a time or a cost perspective be overly burdensome on the uh, individual. And importantly, as we said, that it cannot be a, dis a subterfuge for discrimination. And this is an important part, and, and we discussed that uh, in great detail. Um, and then what we thought was, well, what should our guidance be around what kinds of metrics to be used? And here we used um, the experience of some of the providers who are members of HERO um, and others. And then we used the um, uh, guidance from uh, some of the federal uh, guidance that's been provided and came up and agreed that there should, that four um, factors make a lot of sense in terms of designing this outcomes-based incentive uh, program. One being tobacco use, the second being weight through BMI measurement, the third being blood pressure, and the fourth being cholesterol. And, and, final, and also, obviously, that only health status factors that are modifiable uh, for individuals through change should be considered. Um, Employers, we felt, it really should factor in how much time and what the financial barrier is for the employees in terms of, achieve, of, of achieving these health standards. And, and we want to make sure that the incentive design doesn't place a greater economic burden on one race or ethnic group than another. And then finally, uh, when the incentive is created, that the employer think about whether this should be a reward or it should be offered as a penalty. Both, it could be an either, and it really relates to what the culture, what the culture of the organization is really all about. And so um, there is uh, research that shows that uh, you know takeaways do have an effect. So um, that's one one piece of it. On the other hand, seeing this as a reward can be very uh, beneficial as well. Other, uh, other important considerations that uh, uh, should be noted is did the amount of the incentive really fit within your culture? Although 20% going to 30% of the total health care premium, we saw the dollars involved there allows you great latitude in terms of offering uh, large incentives. Does that really fit within the culture and what you're trying? And, and secondly, would that really drive the amount of behavior change in the population that you're asking for? And then third, if you use penalties, will they have a disproportionate impact against different income levels or eth racial or ethnic groups? What's the impact of these, of these um, incentives? And, and then a further concern or consideration is if the incentives are so large and cost shifting to non-participating or not attaining employees, does it jeopardize their affordability for their health care coverage? So there's a number of things that have to be considered in this as you design and determine what the amount of the uh, incentive might be. And then uh, extremely important is that the design would eliminate a participa participant's access to group coverage, which would really run counter to the fundamental goal of a reasonably designed program to promote health which is the baseline for allowing this discrimination in terms of uh, providing uh, reduced uh, health insurance premiums to those that attain uh, health standards. Um, for those who have medical conditions, then the question became, what should reasonable alternative standards look like? Because the legislation requires that that be offered. 
and um, we suggest that it uh, that it's uh, a standard needs to be offered uh, alternative standard needs to be offered to employees where it's unreasonably difficult to achieve a health standard due to the medical condition or who have a medical reason that makes it inadvisable to do so within the allotted time and this is in the legislation and also for employees with medical condition barriers to meeting the health standard, employee, we feel that the employer should defer to the view of the individual health care provider for setting and achieving these standards or providing a waiver. So um, when you uh, are designing your incentive program, we, we recommend that you consider designs that use goals that are more flexible than ideal, reaching ideal targets. So is it reasonable for someone who has a 40 BMI to um, have to achieve a 25 BMI in order for them to be able to earn the incentive? Is it, can it be achieved? What are the health risks involved in that? And that's, that's one of the things that you need to consider as you're, uh, as you're designing your plan. We suggest that you be flexible when it comes to the use of alternative standards and use them to help individuals with higher health risk and health improve their health habits and overall health as well. So thinking about this whole goal of improving health is now a reason to be offering incentives. What is a reasonable, let's use BMI as an example, what's in a reasonable amount of BMI reduction for those that have health risks. They may be diabetic, they have, they may, they're have obese, they may be diabetic. What kind of uh, improvement is a reasonable? Is it one BMI over 12 months? Is it two BMI? Those are things that, that need to be considered to be flexible to give people the incentive to really try to improve health and not to look at these, uh, these uh, standards as unattainable ones that they cannot uh, be able to achieve, and therefore ones that they don't participate in improving uh, their health around. Uh, one other I, one other thought that we have also is um, we believe that rather than offering just one um, health standard for a tied to the incentive, for example, stop smoking, we believe that uh, and this is through again the experience of some of the providers in our discussion that it would be much much more equitable and uh, would have greater impact to have multiple um, targets in the plan and to be able to spread the cost, the amount of the incentive over these multiple targets that are being offered um, and that allows people that with that need to reach um, their targets through alternatives more opportunity to be able to achieve uh, uh, improved health. Um, we talked about, uh, I just talked about this, about a reward or penalty that's so large that it discourages employees. What's interesting also is, again, through these, these discussions that we've had as we are putting together the guidance document that um, some of the provider members in, involved in this had some experience because, again, going back to the original HIPAA uh, statute that allowed 20% um, reduction or increase in insurance premium related to achieving health standards. It's been on the books since uh, I think it was 2006-2007. Uh, that some of these um, providers have been working with, with clients along that line they have, a, they have some experience in terms of what the amount um, would, uh, might be that would actually move the needle for um, employer populations. And the suggestion is that amounts that range somewhere between $40 and $60 a month, um, based on very limited evidence and not peer-reviewed research, but just experiential, that somewhere between $40 to $60 a month can be uh, uh, in the program would be capable of generating behavior change by many of the participation participants, at least in the short run, because again, we haven't got a long, uh, a long enough time frame to be able to see whether or not it will have any long-term effect. But at least in the short term, that it seems like it takes forty to sixty dollars a month among those organizations that we have some experience in in uh, tracking for them to be able to get behavior change by many of the participants. So that's something to consider. 
Um, as we mentioned, uh, uh, as you design your uh, incentive plan, one, uh, one of the things that uh, we really strongly believe in is that um, the plan looks at uh, providing rewards for progress towards targets instead of just rewarding employees who meet the goal. So again, in order to start to move the population in this direction, think about how you might use what um, has been described by um, some as progress-based incentive approach, moving from participation-based towards outcomes-based if that's, if that's your plan, and as a progress, uh, providing incentives for people who are able to make improvement in, in those health um, standards that, uh, or health targets that uh, we're trying to attain for them. Another thing is um, think about the idea of um, how can you individualize uh, these programs so that it fits better within their framework so that they're able to make these changes over time and, and think about creating tailored individualized programs. This may be in, in conjunction with uh, consultation with um, health coaches, with the employees, or other ways, but how can we individualize this so it really is attainable by the employee? And I think that's a, that's a very important point as well. So um, to learn more, to read more about this, you can see, uh, you can go to the Journal of Occupational Medicine. Um, you can go to our website or the website for any of these uh, collaborating organizations, and we um, uh, welcome you to uh, give us your feedback. We're really looking for feedback, questions, and suggestions uh, relative to this whole area of uh, the appropriate use of outcomes-based incentives. So with that, I think we're completed with the part that I wanted to share, and we just open it up, Mike, left for any questions. Super. Well, please... Uh... Please type in those questions now, and we will get through as many of them as we can. You know, as you were talking, I was uh, the, one of the questions from Craig. Um, I was wondering if somebody would uh, would ask that question, and Craig is wondering. Um, he said, uh, "You were uh, you were just uh, saying how to use incentives, and it seems that uh, we should be asking maybe if incent if to use incentives at all." Um, right. Maybe the first question is, are incentives beneficial? Does research show that? You know, it's interesting. Uh, last week, actually, I was in Detroit and had a chance to visit with Dee Eddington, you know, who's certainly uh, one of the great uh, uh, experts in the field. And we talked about this uh, very specifically. And um, his feeling is that incentives should not be in these programs. And, and then the next day, I had a chance to visit with Kathy Bossie from Dow Chemical, who many of you know. And their program has been very successful over many years, and they don't have incentives in their program. So um, we did not address whether, and Craig, thank you for the question. It's an important question. We did not feel that within the scope of this particular um, uh, document to, that it was appropriate to address whether or not incentives should be in a program. That which should be left to uh, other times to other documents, and there's still a lot of work to be done. But we thought that because so much of the market is moving in this direction, um, that we needed to provide some guidance for employers for their consideration as they move in this in this direction. But it's a great question. There's many organizations that don't offer these kinds of incentives at all. Um, and really, what we believe at Hero is um, it really comes back to the culture that you've created. And what kind of a culture do you have? We know that incentives will uh, increase participation, but what is the culture like? And if the culture is appropriate, it may be that incentives are not necessary at all, such as at Dow where they have a very strong uh, leadership that really is committed to the importance of, of em employee health as a very important part of their business strategy. Thanks for that question. Super. Okay, here's a question from Kathy. She's wondering uh, what mechanism beyond self-reporting um, can be used to verify non-tobacco use? Well, of course, uh, you know, uh, I think through screening, you know, one of the, I was going to mention this too, thanks Kathy, you know, one of the things that um, 
for especially for those organizations that are moving in the direction of outcomes-based incentive, an important part of that, of course, is screening events. And um, uh, we are actually, uh, this group of organizations is working collaboratively to create a guidance document for employers around screening, specifically around screenings events. So that's all part of it. And we feel like this document around screenings event um, will help employers as well uh, consider um, uh, whether to do I offer these on-site screenings um, and how they should be done. And we hope to be able to give a fair amount of guidance in that area. Yeah, I think that's really needed. Um, yeah, and that'll be coming out later this year. In fact, we had a meeting of that group. That's about 25 people representing these organizations. They're working very diligently on creating this follow-up document specific to screenings. Super. Yeah, I, th I think uh, a lot of people have questions around that, and it kind of yeah. um, dovetails pretty well into Patty's question. Um, with this, you know, how does this relate um, to incentive guidelines within HIPAA? How talk about that some more? Yeah. Well, these it, it directly relates to those incentive guidelines within HIPAA, and of course, our our guidance is that this is not intended to be uh, a legal determination. You still have to work with your own attorneys to look at the design of your program and how it complies with HIPAA. But what we did was actually look at those uh, at the legislation, the Affordable Care Leg Act legislation, which codified the HIPAA regs or statutes around this area. So it very specifically addresses the issue around the HIPAA requirements as they relate to these um, differentials in offering uh, reductions or increases in insurance premiums for people who either achieve or don't achieve these uh, health standards. Well, keep asking your questions. Um, you know, it's, um, living near Washington, D.C., I had the, the uh, I wouldn't exactly say pleasure, but maybe the opportunity to uh, have direct insight into how, the, as this was uh, being formed, I was you know, sitting at this massive table at the U.S. Chamber where, you know, for example, the American Cancer Society were very, very adamant about protecting people with cancer, you know, and how to ensure that these guidelines don't discriminate against, you know, people with um, disease states. Right, exactly. So those people were at the table as we started to put this guidance together. And, you know, what HIPAA really says, there are five requirements, and um, I'm just going to uh, cite those requirements. One is that the total amount of the reward or penalty uh, is contingent on satisfying a health standard must not exceed 20%, as we said, and goes to 30%. Two, that the program must be reasonably designed to promote health and wellness, which we discussed. And again, the whole concept of what's a de reasonably designed program is really one we tried to address in this document. The third one is that individuals should be offered the opportunity to qualify for the reward under this kind of a program at least once a year. And then fourth, that the reward should be available to all similar situated individuals. If it's unreasonably difficult to uh, due to an employee's medical condition or inadvisable, medically inadvisable, uh, the individual should be offered in an alternative. So this becomes the alternative standard piece. And then fifth, communications is important. And it su suggests that all program communications uh, must describe the terms of the incentive and must clearly disclose the availability of a reasonable alternative standards and the possibility of a waiver. So those are the five basic requir HIPAA requirements that are addressed in the legislation. And there certainly is. Time. And as you notice, in our conversation, we're addressing um, alternative standards and a reasonably designed program, which are the two elements that are really not described and left very general. And based on the consensus of these groups looking at it from very different perspectives, what we agree on should be uh, the approach. Well, I think it's a, a, a monumental task <laughs> that you've. Uh... Well, you know, it, you know, one of the interesting things of this about this is that we were actually, as a group, be able to come together from very different perspectives and be able to speak with one voice. Hmm. And I think that you know, Michael O'Donnell, early on in this discussion, talking, you know, uh, uh, about 
this whole approach and talking about the importance of speaking with one voice and some of the things that he's written, that we were actually able to do this. And I give great credit to um, uh, the consumer advocacy groups for really reaching out because they reached out to us to, to see if we would be willing to sit down, convene a group of advice of uh, employers, consultants, and providers to discuss this whole approach together to better understand the approach, how it's being used, and to discuss some of the concerns that they had. And it was through that collaborative process that we got to this point. And I think it speaks well for the future of the field and how we can come together even though we have different perspectives in many things. Mm, absolutely. Um, Kathy, uh, was wondering if you could reiterate, I think you said that um, that the uh, incentive differential goes to 30% in 2014? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, according to law, it goes to, uh, it can go up to 30%. doesn't mean you have to offer 30%, obviously, but it means that you have leeway to go up to 30% 30, 30 in 2014 and gives HHS the ability to raise it to 50% if they believe that it's being very effective and, and uh, raising it to that level would be uh, important. Well, it's, an inter it's certainly an interesting idea. I, I think about, you know, when, on the one hand, it's carrot and sticks for sure. But think about how long it took to change, you know, the the general population thoughts on tobacco use, and you know, is, is yeah. this uh, is this the beginning of that? I don't know. Well, you, you know, we we address that a little bit because we talk about, you know, when you think about seatbelt use and uh, worksite safety and recycling and smoking, you know. Um, in those areas, there's a lot of the times there was your know, financial incentives that were used in either fines or user fees or other kinds of incentive, financial incentives that were designed. But along with that, if you think about these other areas where we really kind of made societal changes in the way we did things, there was a, a broader strategy that was in, that it was part of uh, that dealt with you know capacity building, educating the, the population, creating a culture where these new norms were acceptable and uh, were actually uh, preferred, and policy then followed that. And, uh, you know, and I think that, again, when we look at this whole issue of incentives, it's within the structure of a well-designed program. It should be considered as a tool that uh, may be used and not as a program itself but really is a tool, and we feel, as I mentioned at the start, that the base, the, really the, the base of that uh, program is really around building a strong culture of health or building health into the culture of the organization. <laughs>